today, one of our own has said enough is enough and is buying that <laughs> stock. And that person is Josh Brown. Hi, America. You bought Uber. No, I did, but it's a trade. It's, it's not yet an investment. And I'll tell you what I was thinking. Um, so I wanted to let things settle down a little bit. This is basically a stock that has not moved in price in, in almost three years. It's been the same valuation. Uh, it's been higher. Um, but once the dust settled after the IPO, um, it lost 40 briefly. I saw it in the high 30s. And I saw the way in which it was accumulated very quickly. I know some of that was the way that uh, underwriters are supporting the deal, and that's fine. I don't really care that much about it a week later. Um, but I, I have a stop just below the 40 level. Um, I might get taken out of it and reevaluate. It's not yet an investment. I do want to um, be involved in it because I think my, my potential upside versus my downside with that stop limit in place is, is a, a phenomenal situation. Um, and this might be the type of trade that I have to put on multiple times before it sticks. Once it does start moving to the upside, though, Scott, um, again, it is something that I, I want to have on as a trade. And then I'll be listening, like everyone else on Earth, to uh, the first conference call. Uh, the one thing about the CEO that's, that's uh, in my book, a win, is he's going out of his way to tamp down expectations. He's being very deliberate um, about pe keeping people calm. He's not a promotional guy. And that's exactly what this situation calls for, given the size of this company's market cap right out of the gate. And we'll see what happens. So you're not a full-blown believer. No, I'm not. Uh, I think there are still a lot of questions that, if I were to become a long-term investor, still need to be answered. And I don't think they're going to get answered the first quarter or even the second quarter they report. The big question for me um, is not whether or not they can get to profitability, because they can if they chose to stop spending. The bigger question is, what do the unit-level economics look like six months from now, a year from now, now that they've raised all this money, um, now that they've shown the kind of hyper-growth they needed to in order to get a $70 billion valuation? At what point do they stop subsidizing rides mm -hmm. in, in most locations? That's more interesting to me than just profitability at the corporate level, because as we've learned from Netflix, from Amazon, companies have levers they could pull if they have to show profitability. Uber doesn't have to right now. It's just they, they raised eight billion bucks. Let, let's refresh people's memory, too, right? It priced at 45. It opened at 42. You all see where it is now. It's above that level. Uh, Joe, Doc, Steve, Shannon are here with us today as well on the desk as we, as we kick this around. What do you think well, I just of, of what Josh has done and what he said? If it's just for a trade, why not Lyft instead of Uber? And could you apply the same type of thinking to Lyft for a trade? So uh, Lyft claims that it's got a third of the market. I don't think it does. I also think a lot of drivers use both. I think Uber's in a better position uh, market share-wise, at least in the bigger markets, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. And the way I've been taught is, is always to go with the biggest and best player, um, especially in a nascent technology. Um, I know that's not always true. There are periods of time, for example, when AMD outperforms, uh, has outperformed Intel over the last 20 years, but overall Intel's been a better uh, investment. So on Uber, I think it's the market leader. I think the name of the company is a verb. I think this is a company that has literally changed human behavior forever. Um, I'm a user of the service myself. Almost everyone I know is. So I, I think they'll, they'll keep their place in the lead, and I want to own the leader. Um, the other thing is that Lyft is not as broad. So Uber's going into other lines of business. Right, like Who knows how successful? But Lyft is, to me, an overcapitalized taxi and limousine company. I'm not excited about being invested in a taxi and limousine company. I think Uber's got potential to do a lot more. Doc? Um, I was short Lyft, knock on wood, all the way down to basically 50 bucks a share. Um, uh, and uh, as I published on Twitter repeatedly as I was taking profits on that drop, I thought it would go back down to and through the $15 billion raise level that was their last raise prior to going public. You look where Uber is now, it's making people look pretty foolish that we're saying 120 billion, you know, is what this thing's gonna come public at. Obviously nowhere near that, and even right now. But to Josh's point, they do have more levers. I just worry that they don't win in any market except the United States. If that's well, the case, and, and the street punishes them for that, I yep. won't be in it anymore. Right. So, so that's my why risk, you're saying my risk is 5% to the downside. Yep, I think uh, that's smart. If, I don't think that this was ever going to be worth $120 billion out of the gates. I think that was underwriter talk. Right. Um, I don't think it'll ever be worth that, period. It may not. I don't right. know. So but for, I, for you, I like the upside downside. For you uh, to turn a, a trade, I'm sorry, for you to turn a trade into an investment, you have to get more on board 
in some respects with the growth prospects. And, and you have to sort of reconcile why the, the company has traded the way it has after it came public. Remember, we talked to Mark it's too Cuban. Big. Let's it's listen too to what, okay, on that note, let's listen to what Mark Cuban told us the other day yep. um, okay. about how it's traded, what he made of the whole thing, and where it goes from here. It's not a surprise. It's not a growth company. It's not, you know, it's a, it's a brand. It's, you know, it's an eight year old company, nine year old company. They just waited too long, and there's nothing exciting about it. You know, maybe they'll introduce something new. Maybe Uber Eats will explode, and the numbers will show something incredible. But I, I don't think you could have expected anything different. So that throws a good bit of cold water on the investment thesis, doesn't it? Perhaps. I don't agree that it's not a growth company. It's obviously a growth company. But um, I, I, I think maybe he meant something different than, than the way it Well, maybe out. the suggestion is it's a much more mature company than people are or at least trying that's to true. And what Mark and, and actually Mark's point about the size, like that's, I think, why it didn't get a huge upside reception. If you wanted to be invested in Uber over the last five years, you had no problem. You call your guy at Morgan Stanley, they'll put you in a fund that gives you access to shares. Um, you, you, if you're even, even reasonably well connected with anyone in Silicon Valley, they were shares for sale. You could have already they gotten into it. They were shares for sale. They were shares for sale. Up right. There were hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of the shareholders. There are hundreds so, of shareholders so already. So here's how I'd look at it. If you put your Jimmy Choo's back on Scott and take a walk down memory lane, I came out in the day that Lyft <laughs> priced and very impassioned plea about the company, where I was wrong. And is that I violated my discipline investing in a company that had massive losses with no reasonable, reasonable path to profitability. And I think that's where Uber is. So it's a great, from a consumer experience, I like it. It's not a perfect consumer experience. I like it. But separating the consumer experience from the company as a stock, and I have no problem with the trade. I think it's bottom tier, maximum negativity. It can trade up. But I just can't invest in companies that don't have that path. However, People have done it for a while. You take a look at, at uh, Tesla. Why is Tesla var valued where it is? There's no reason for it, right? I mean, it was all a dream. So people come out, take the scarcity value of this company and scarcity value of Lyft, and maybe they buy it. But to me, that's the greater fool theory. And the reason why the valuations got so high is that there's just massive floods of capital going into VC funds, going into private equity funds, and they had to put it to work, so they kept buying it and buying it. I don't think that's a long-term investment philosophy. I think to make this a, a true uh, investment, I think there's two things. To Josh's point, getting some resolution on how much subsidizing is going to be done over the course of the next five years. And number two, there's a, the, the labor force for Uber is one that they do not control. And therefore, there's going to be issues with um, how much uh, revenue the, ride, the, the, the actual drivers are getting. And I think that that's going to continue to be put some pressure on the company over the next two to three years. So I think that's right. But they would, so they would point to not controlling the, the drivers as a strength is the first thing that they would say. And then the second thing that they would not say, but that's uh, in the back of everyone's mind, is that not within two years, but within 10 years, there might be um, cars without drivers. But it's, 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 it's right, and, that, and, that could, right. and that could change. And I think, but I also well, that's think be expensive. Knows. We don't, that's and we be don't expensive. know. Yeah. That would be very expensive to do, and that's at least five years away, no matter what Elon says about 2020, right, 2022. But... Here's what I'd say. They're finding drivers right now with employment at all-time record levels. They're not always going to be that way. I'm not worried about them able to find drivers who aren't going to make any money when, when the economy starts turning. So that's not the issue. The issue is, and we saw the NLRB come out earlier uh, this week, I believe it was then, that said, hey, no, they're independent contracts. That was huge move news but it didn't get the stock still above the IPO I think there's a, and I, I think there's something about the way the economy works now there's another company filed for its S1 yesterday called Fiverr this is an Israeli platform but it's all over the world for freelance workers Total gig. Um, the, mo, a lot of the people that do work for us in our business are outside of the company whereas 20 years ago yep. they might have been employees I think this is the way of the world I do agree though that that is an existential threat to Uber is if an important jurisdiction, somebody said, you know what, these are actually your employees, you got to do benefits for them, they're W-2 employees. That would obviously take everyone out of the stock. But if that's not going to happen, then you have a company that figured out tipping. There was no tipping on the Uber app until three years ago. Now it's fairly widespread. I think that did help the drivers. I'm sure they want more. Um, but they are finding ways to make it a more palatable experience to drive for them. And if they weren't, 
then they wouldn't have millions of drivers. These people aren't at gunpoint. So uh, I think that's relatively low on the totem pole of things I'm worried about. Again, I'm much more worried about can they get the unit level economics of a ride in an Uber um, to the point where each ride is, if not very profitable, at least a little bit profitable. They're not there yet, and there is an open question whether or not they ever will.